So the house I was growing up in when I was a kid and a teenager, um, we were on an acre of ground and there were woods behind our house that our neighbor let us play in. We, I could go and explore in the woods. And one day, my dad came up to me and he said, I have a job for you. Your mother and I are going to a meeting and we'll be back later. And what I want you to do is I want you to burn some trash for us. We lived out in the country, you know, where you can burn your own trash if you want. And um, he gave me very specific instructions. He said, it's windy today. And so what I want you to do is I want you to burn, put something on there, let it burn all the way down before you throw something else on. Let it burn all the way down, then throw something else on. So I'm doing that. I'm following the instructions. My dad would be proud. I'm doing it the way he said, because he said, I don't want something to blow off. It's windy today. I don't want something to blow off. So I'm doing that. And I get towards the end of the stuff that I was supposed to burn. And I remembered that in our garage, which was about 50 yards away from where I was burning the trash, in our garage were these, um, we had rabbits and these rabbit feed bags, these, the food that would come in were like this long, you know, and, and, and that why uh, there was a stack of them in the garage. And I wanted my dad to come home and be proud that I burned everything, that I got it all done. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run as fast as I can. I'm gonna run back to the garage. And I was, I was a fast runner. I was in track in, in ninth grade. So I'm a fast runner. So I ran as fast as I could, got the bags, ran as fast as I could back. And in that short time, maybe two minutes, something had blown off into the grass and was headed towards the woods. And so I ran back to the house. I called for my brother, my older brother. I said, Barry, there's a fire. And so he calls for my younger sister, Ori. He says, Ori, call 911. And me and my brother, he takes me and we go and we grab buckets. And we're filling up these buckets at the spigot at the house and running a half an acre or more out to where this fire is. And we're throwing water. We're, we're passing each other on the way back. You know, I'm running out with a bucket. He's coming back with his empty bucket. At one point, the fire has started to catch the leaves on the trees. And I was like, Oh no, that's it. I'm burning the forest down. Like, uh, that's it. I'm going to be on the news for burning the woods down. And I had Smokey the Bear in my head, shaking his head like, you did not prevent a forest fire today. So we're literally throwing water up in the trees now, up in the leaves of the tree to put this thing out. It was bad. Now, thankfully, we got all the fire put out before the fire truck got there. And when the fire truck got there, it was this pitiful little fire truck. I'm just like, I don't think that thing would have put the fire out anyway. Me and my brother put it out, team effort, team Harper, we got it done. Uh, and what couldn't have done it without him, without uh, all of us doing our part. So today we're talking about um, how dev the devil, Satan has different schemes, different tactics that he uses. And today we're talking about the tactic of division and where we need unity and where Jesus prayed for unity in the garden before he went to the cross, Satan is trying to divide us. Second Corinthians 2 10 says, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul said we are not unaware of his schemes. And I agree with him. I don't think we need to be unaware. I think we need to know the tactics that the enemy is using. Would you agree? We need to know the tactics so that we know how to counter attack his tactics. Um, so Satan loves to drive a wedge between people. Between husbands and wives and fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and brothers and sisters in Christ. He loves to drive a wedge between people and get them mad at each other and, and give up on each other. His goal is to create friction where God meant for there to be harmony. He, he tries to create fighting where there should be peace. He sows seeds of hatred where there should be love. And a lot of times he succeeds. So when I was thinking about this, this message about Satan's tactic of division and uh, what came to my mind is the Batman movie with the Joker that was played by Heath Ledger. You know who I'm talking about? Why so, so serious? serious. <laughs> yes. Why so serious? Like that guy, whoever wrote the plot of his character, 
they must be genius because I'm like, how do you even think of these plots to put in these movies? This guy is like pure evil, right? He will hurt anybody. He will take out anybody. He doesn't care. He's ruthless, but he's also very smart. These, these tactics, these schemes that he put together, very sophisticated, devious, diabolical plots. And so uh, one of the movies, he took out Harvey Dent. You know, Harvey Dent was the mayor of Gotham, and he was doing a good job. And so what does the Joker do? How can I take this guy out? And so he kidnaps Harvey Dent. He kidnaps Batman's girlfriend. He puts them in separate places and says, I've rigged with explosives, and you only have time to save one. It's like, what a mind game, right? Like, how do you pick? And, and so he ends up saving his girlfriend, actually by accident. He was trying to save Harvey, but whatever. Uh, but Harvey blows up, lays in a pool of gasoline, and it burns his face. Think about the results of this whole plan. So Harvey Dent now becomes Two-Face. He goes from a good guy, he's now a bad guy, right? And, and also he drove a wedge between Harvey Dent and Batman, and really Harvey Dent and everyone. Harvey Dent is now mad at the world. Right? Like he's angry at the whole world. Um, Batman realizes he has to take the blame and he now goes into hiding. Like if you're the Joker, that was the perfect results. Like to tear the whole city apart. Take out the face of Gotham, Harvey Dent. Um, and then in another scene, which is like just evil, uh, he gets two, two boats and he has the good citizens of Gotham on one boat and nothing but criminals on the other boat. And then he radios in and tells them, I've rigged both boats with explosives. And if you don't trick, you have a detonator. And if you don't blow up the other boat, both of your boats will be blown up in 15 minutes. Like what? That's crazy. And so you know what's going on. The good citizens are like, pull the trigger, blow up the criminals. Like they're criminals. We're upstanding citizens, right? The criminals are like, blow them up. We just save our own skin, right? Like this guy is the master of pitting people against each other. Pure evil. I think he studied under the devil, or at least whoever wrote the plot. <laughs> like, that's, it's pretty evil. Now, fortunately in the movie, the Joker's plan backfires and the good wins, right? But unfortunately, in real life, Satan wins more times than I'd like to see him win. Uh, and he's successful at breaking up families, at splitting churches, at dividing nations. And personally, I'm sick and tired of it. Like, is anybody else sick of the devil having his way yes. with us? Now, let's check out God's plan to defeat Satan. So how can we have victory? First of all, we need to stand together. We need to stand together. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is hopefully you're on page 950 of our church Bibles. I'm going to actually ask you to stand if you're here while we read this. If you will stand while we read Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18, and here's what I want you to do, is I'm going to be reading all the words, but when you see the word stand, I want you all to say the word stand together as we follow along. Does that make sense? You all are going to say the word stand as we come across it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains." 
Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. All right, you can be seated. Did you notice how many times the word stand was in there? Quite a few, wasn't it? The way we're going to defeat the devil and his tactic of division is to stand together. And if my brother Mike could come on up, please. We're going to do our best to illustrate this together. So, Mike, if you'll just uh, join me here. And we're gonna we're gonna sit back to back. Uh, hopefully this works. <laughs> and we're gonna try to stand together. Get your feet under you. You ready? Yeah. Go. Yes! We did it! We stood together. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I was really hoping that would work. And I had faith that with Mike it would. And it did. Our, the way we are going to win this battle is to stand together. To stand together. So, um, Roman soldiers, when they, uh, some of you have seen these movies with Roman soldiers in it, and they have these shields. And what they do, these shields were designed to connect together and make a wall. Have you seen these movies with the Roman soldiers? They make a whole wall that goes in front of them. It actually covers them on top and they move forward together as a unit. That's how we're going to win this battle is by taking up our shields, connecting together and standing together and moving together as a force. That's how we're gonna be successful. Um, and I have to believe that when Paul wrote about this, he was, he was a very intelligent person. He knew about the strategies of the Roman armies. I think he had that in his mind as he wrote about standing together and he wrote about the shield of faith. So what does standing together look like? What does it mean to stand together? First of all, don't leave others behind and stay with the group. Don't leave others behind. When it comes to Satan, he uses the picking off the stragglers technique, right? So we've, we've all seen the Discovery Channel. We can picture it in our heads where the lion is chasing down the, the flock or the group of antelope, right? Or whatever. The, the lion is chasing this group. And what does the lion do? All he has to do is just keep chasing the group until the weak one falls behind. And now he's got his lunch. The weak one fell behind. That's Satan's technique. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He's chasing after us, looking for someone to devour. By the way, it's interesting what Peter's solution to the devil is. Verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Same thing Paul said. Stand firm. Now, in the animal kingdom, they don't care as animals if the weak one fell behind and got eaten, right? They don't care. They're not thinking about that. But as Christians, we need to be concerned when one of our weak ones falls behind or falls to the side. Agree? Yes. We need to be concerned for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have to watch out for each other. And then, if you're the one thinking about leaving the group, don't. Don't leave the group. If you think you can hang in there as a Christian without having a solid group of other Christians as your support, it's not going to work. It's, it's not going to work. I've seen it time and time and time again. When people get disconnected from the body of Christ, bad things happen. It leads to them, their faith fizzling out. It just, it just happens like clockwork. And that's why when I start seeing people not be there on Sunday mornings, I get concerned. Because it's, it's the telltale signs that I've seen in, in 14 years of ministry. Not a good sign. They're on their way out. And so um, we need to stick together. How's that saying go? There's strength in numbers. numbers. We need to stick together. All the instructions to Christians assume that they will be together with other Christians. When you come together, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 tells to Christians, when you come together, use your gifts to build others up. Wait for one another before taking communion, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. Show hospitality to one another, 1 Peter 4, 9. 
Show hospitality. Think about that. That means you're having people who are not part of your family into your house, right? That's who you show hospitality to. Um, you know, there's this, this false mindset that, well, I can be a Christian, and as long as I'm around the other Christians in my home, then I'm good to go. No, 1 Peter 4 says, show hospitality to one another. Bring, let, it, it assumes you're having other people into your house that are not your family, that you're welcoming and you're showing um, good hospitality to. Serve one another in love, Galatians 5.13. Encourage one another, Hebrews 10, 25. Let the message about Christ in all its fullness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts, Colossians 3, 16. Does it sound like we're supposed to gather together and be around other Christians according to these verses? Yes. Yeah. We, we need it. It's vital to our souls. It's vital to our survival. And so on your next steps, on your connect card, um, the first one says, recommit yourself to gathering with other Christians. Recommit yourselves. Do whatever it takes. You know, if, if maybe you've been away from church for a long time, maybe you're watching this video and you're like, I haven't been to church in years, in decades. Would you give church a chance again? Would you give it a chance? Maybe your, your issue is not getting to bed early enough. You know, do whatever it takes. Get to bed earlier so that you can get up in the morning and be with God's people. Uh, maybe it's a work issue and you need to start praying, God, would you open up a way so that I can be with my church family on Sunday mornings? You know, tell your boss. Say, listen, I can be there on Sundays, but I, can, I like to go to church in the morning. Is it okay if I come in at 12? Can I be there at 12? You know, maybe your boss will work with you. But recommit yourself um, to gathering with other Christians. And then the next one says, call up two people you haven't seen in person or online. So if you're here in person and you know people usually, uh, you know, our people usually attend here in person and you haven't seen that person in two or three weeks, call that person up and say, hey, are you OK? If you're usually watching online and you haven't seen that other person online that usually joins online, Contact them, call them up, say, hey, are you okay? I just want to check on you because I love you, because I care about you. So some of you want to check that one. All right, so don't leave others behind. Stay with the group. Prayer, <clears throat> one very real way we can help each other is by praying for each other on a regular basis. Um, Ephesians 6, 18, we read that, said, with this in mind, pray for all the saints. What is the this? With what in mind, Paul, did you have in mind? I think it means with the spiritual battle in mind. With all this spiritual battle that he just talked about, with this in mind, pray for all the saints. Like Satan's attacking, we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, Acts 12, 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Earnestly praying. I love that phrase. What a statement. Earnestly praying on their knees for their brother in Christ. And what was the result? God made the chains fall off of him and an angel led him out of prison, a free man, because the church was praying for him. Prayer works. Do you believe that this morning? Yes. Prayer works. And I've been really encouraged by what I see on Facebook by our members you guys are rock stars when it comes to this. Like you see a prayer request pop up there. Hey, pray for so-and-so. And you guys get on there and you're like, I'm praying. And I don't know about you, but I have to do it right then or else I will forget. Because I'm, I, I used to be that person that was just terrible about saying, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll definitely pray for you. And then I forgot. So what I did is I would just stop right then. And I would pray for whatever the prayer request is. And then I would comment back, just prayed. Done. Pray. Do it right then. Do it right then. But you guys have been doing a great job on that. And I'll tell you, we, the leadership of this church, we covet your prayers. I promise you that we pray for you uh, on a daily basis. And we pray for you by name. And we would love to have your prayers back. And so that's one of the next steps. Did you know that, by the way? Did you know we pray for all of you by name, daily? Me and Andre do. My parents pray for you guys. We love you guys. And we pray for you. And we would appreciate the prayers back. 
Um, so that's one of your next steps. Pray for your church members, for your church leaders, five days this week. Some of you may want to do that. And then this last one is, uh, oh, I, I just want to put this out there too, is uh, those of you watching online, you are more than welcome to join our Impact Family Group and post prayer requests. If, if you're watching this and you want a group that you can be a part of and post prayer requests and pray, you know, people pray for you, you pray for them, by all means, uh, you know, ask to be a part of our Impact Family Group, which is different from our Impact Church Reynoldsburg um, public page. Impact Family, and we would love to have you and pray for you. So this last one, if we're gonna have unity, is work out your problems and deal with conflict as it comes. Work out your problems. So did, did anybody of, of you hear about the story about Frank, the Christmas gargoyle? <laughs> so it's hilarious. So there was this lady who, for whatever reason, around Christmas time, this past Christmas, she lives in the Dayton area, put out this big, gnarly looking gargoyle on her front doorstep, on her front porch. And one of the neighbors, we'll call her Karen, this Karen comes along and, and writes her a note and leaves her a note that, hey, I don't think your gargoyle is very festive and you need to take it down. So, so this lady's like, oh really? You want, you want me to take it down? Because it's not festive enough? Okay, so she, she put a Santa Claus hat on it and a Santa Claus beard on it. It's like, there, now it's more festive. So the lady writes another note back and says, no, this is not good. Take it down, take it down. So the lady's like, she just takes it as a challenge. And she keeps adding more and more stuff that's like not Christmas related. She put a hippopotamus in there, a stuffed animal hippopotamus. And like, yeah, hippos are Christmas. Um, so the lady just keeps writing these notes. Back and forth they go like 10 different times. You can read an article. There's all of, it's all documented in her social media. There's this one page I found that tells the whole story each step of the way. At one point, the, the lady puts a box on her doorstep for the lady to drop her notes in because she knows another one's coming. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, I'll just make a box for her. So um, she threatened, you know, the lady threatened in her note, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the HOA and I'm for personal friends with the mayor and, and you're going to lose and you're going to regret this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Pretty funny story. Is this, the question is, is this how we're supposed to deal with conflict God's way? Is that the Bible way of dealing with conflict? Is sending notes and just, all right, well, I'm going to put one more decoration out just to spite you, you know, kind of thing. So we're going to throw up here three different passages that say we should deal with friction between people. So Matthew 18, I'm just going to summarize these. Matthew 18 talks about um, if your brother or sister has sinned against you, um, you need to go to them and just between the two of you, try to work that out. And if that doesn't work, you come back with two or three witnesses and there's this whole process. But the point is this, that the first step is it says go and just between the two of you, try to work things out. That's the way that God wants us to deal with things. The second passage says um, in Matthew 5, it's basically saying, uh, if you go to worship God, you go to do your acts of worship, and you remember that somebody has something against you, God actually wants you to drop what you're doing, the, the worshiping, those acts of worship, and first go and be reconciled to your brother. And once you've worked things out, then come back and worship. That's how important it is to God, is that he wants us to be right with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then Ephesians 4, 25 through 27 <clears throat> says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Did you catch that? Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. So what it's saying is when you stuff things and you, you just, you know, try to bury things and not deal with the anger and, and you let it, you let it fester, it just grows and grows and grows. And when we do that, it says we give the devil a foothold. 
And if you get into the Greek words that it was originally written in, it literally means place. You're giving him a place in your life to do damage, to take that thing that was already friction, and he's going to multiply it. He's going to make it even worse. He's going to make more disaster. How many of you have seen that happen in your life? Where because you didn't deal with something right away, it festered and it got worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So you know this is true. God's trying to help us here and tell us it's better to deal with it sooner than later. And not just try to sweep it under the rug. Um, you know, church splits really upset me for several reasons. But the main reason is because Satan won. He won the battle. You know, Satan got people fighting over things that don't even really matter. And the bad thing is they couldn't figure out a way to compromise and to come to some kind of agreement. They couldn't work it out. Satan won in that situation because not only are these people that used to fellowship together not fellowshipping together, but it also gave a bad witness to the community. And it's, it's sad. When I see two people that used to be friends that aren't talking to each other anymore, over some argument or something that happened. Satan won. That was his goal, and, and we let him win when we let that happen. But when we work through difficult times and disagreements, it actually makes the relationship stronger. Have you seen that happen? It makes it stronger. The way we're going to win is by standing together, grabbing each other's hand and saying, you're my brother in Christ, you're my sister in Christ, and we are not going to let Satan divide us. Agree? Let's do that. Let's do that. Have you ever watched a movie in closing? Have you ever watched a movie and there was a spot in the movie where you saw a person walking into a bad situation and you're like, no, don't go in there. Don't do that. Has that ever happened to you? Right? So I was watching that, that Batman movie I was talking about and the Joker had planted this cell phone with explosives. He likes explosives, apparently. Um, cell phone with explosives inside of this other person who was in the jail with him. Sick. I mean, he's just like a sick individual. But um, and, and then he starts taunting this, this police officer um, on purpose. He knows what he's doing. He starts taunting him. He's like, so how many of how many of your fellow officers did I kill? Did I? And, and he's just making him mad on purpose. And, and, and the goal is he's like, to get him to let him get his one phone call. And, and when he gets his one phone call, it's to that cell phone that blows up the, the jail, right? But as I'm watching the Joker taunt this police officer, I'm like, no, don't do it. It's a trick. Like, I've seen enough of this movie to know he's trapping you right now. Don't fall for the trick, right? And, and so many times I see Satan trying to drive a wedge between people. And I'm like, no, don't fall for the trick. Don't take the bait. That's a trap. And he's going to get you, and you're going to lose. You're going to lose the relationship. You're going to lose a friendship. You're going to lose whatever. You're going to lose, right? And, and we can't take the bait. we got to be smarter than that. We can't let him, Satan, outwit us. And so um, if you, you know, th this happens in the church world because there's people in it. Uh, occasionally, things happen between people in the church. You know, um, things friction you know, disagreements, whatever, um, what God wants us to do, the God honoring thing to do is work out those differences and continue to love one another. Um, I'm going to call it take care of business, T-C-O-B, take care of business. And so, you know, maybe, maybe you have a problem with me, the way I've done something or a decision I made, one of the elders, one of the deacons, one of your brothers and sisters in Christ, or a brother or sister in Christ somewhere else. God wants you to take care of business and work that out. And uh, I gave a lesson like this similar at a different church, and I, I gave that charge to people. And uh, there was this girl named Stacy, this lady named Stacy, who um, one of the elders would nickname her Stace. He just It was just something he did on his own, just started calling her Stace all the time. And she actually went to this person and said, hey, you know how you call me Stace? And he goes, yeah. She goes, I actually don't like to be called Stace. <laughs> um, can you just call me Stacy? And he was like, yeah, sure. You know, I, I never knew. That's that's fine. I'll call you Stacy. I won't call you Stace anymore. And it worked out. And I was so proud of that girl for having the guts to actually go and have that conversation. It might seem like a silly thing to us, but it, it was a big deal to her. And they worked it out. That honors God. 
when we work out our differences like that, that honors God. And the thing is, he wouldn't have known if she hadn't told him that, right? We're, we're not mind readers. We don't know that we're doing something that bothers someone until unless they tell us, right? That's the only way we can give that person truly a chance to change. So, um, Christian and Eliana, would you give one of those to, to each person, please? So the last next step is take care of business. If you've got something that's bothering you, um, if somebody else you know, has rubbed you the wrong way or there's friction uh, between anybody, I'm asking you to take care of business today and, and go and bring unity where there was friction. Approach that person and share what's bothering you. All right, guys. So talking about friction between people. Um, so here's what the Bible says about our situation with God. Um, so when we do something the Bible calls sin, which is breaking God's laws, you know, God has, has put different um, rules for living in place for us. Why? Because he made us. And because he made us, he gets to make up the rules. And, and so when you do things that go against God's ways of living, that the Bible calls that sin. Um, and when we sin, even one sin is all it takes, it messes up our relationship with God. There's now a barrier. There's friction between us and God. And God doesn't want that friction to be there. He wants us to be at peace with him, to be made right with God. And so he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, taking the punishment that should have been ours. And if we will in faith accept that sacrifice on our behalf, the punishment that should have been ours, we're the ones who sinned, not Jesus. But he said, I'll take your place. Um, that's, that's part of the steps to becoming a Christian, to having those sins erased and, and, and bringing us and God back together and things being made right with him again. And so do you believe that Jesus was the son of God who died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose from the dead after three days? Would you be willing to repent of your sins, which means change your ways, change your mind and change the way you live. Turn away from doing those things that God doesn't want us doing and living for him. Would you be willing to be buried in the waters of baptism, letting someone else dunk you under the water and, and bringing you back up uh, and baptizing you. And then after that, he charges us to live for God for the rest of our life. It's a lifelong commitment. It's not just a one-time decision. Um, he's asking us to get on board with his mission of sharing that message that I just said with the rest of the world and those who don't know Jesus. Um, and so would you get on board with his mission and share the message and help people in need and show the love of Jesus? Um, we got some cool things in place, by the way, uh, coming up in the future where we're going to serve, and we're going to pack some food. But anyway, don't let me get sidetracked. Um, you need Jesus. You need Jesus in your life. And if you've never done that, we invite you at this time to make that decision to live for God. To, if you need to be made right with God and brought back together with him, um, he invites you this morning to do that. So if you're here in person, uh, we're going to sing a song, and uh, I invite you to just come up and see me here to the side. And if you're watching online, you can send us a message and say, um, yeah, I need that. I, I need more help in taking those steps, uh, taking the next step to um, have my sins washed away and live for God. Uh, just send us a message to the Impact Church Reynoldsburg um, Facebook page. Just send us a message there.